All right, so let's get started. Um, so again, I want to remind you guys, we are having exam uh, number one tomorrow, okay? Um, <clears throat> and homework number four, it's up online. It's due a week after tomorrow's exam, okay? So those are two reminder items. Um, so we'll, um, last time we were about to finish chapter three, um, I don't know, example, but let's take a look what we learned um, as new content last time. So we, we took a look at the heat capacities of an ideal gas, um, mainly um, for two processes. One is constant pressure and then one is um, constant volume. So in general, constant pressure process will have heat capacity that is greater than um, a constant volume process that's been, um, <clears throat> been proved um, through the mathematical pro, um, procedure over here. So basically CP will have one extra term of P delta V than CV in the numerator there, okay? Um, and further, we um, took a look detail that uh, we found that CP is equal to CV plus M times R, okay? <clears throat> so for a monatomic ideal gas, then we only consider um, the energy from the motion in three dimensions. So it's three halves of NRT for, C, for the um, internal energy. So then the um, specific heat, molar heat capacity, CV is equal to three halves of NR or the not molar heat, but heat capacity is equal to three um, halves of NR. So for the molar heat capacity, then it should be just three halves of R, okay? <clears throat> molar um, heat capacity is the capacity divided by the mole, all right? And then for heat capacity for the constant pro, uh, pressure process is five halves of NR, okay? Um, we also took a look at the adiabatic process for an ideal gas. So in that process, there's no heat transfer uh, for the system with its surrounding. So DQ should be equal to zero. So starting from there, um, we kind of derive this equation. So PV um, to the gamma power is equal to constant, where gamma is equal to um, heat capacity for constant pro pressure process over the heat capac capacitance for the constant volume process. Okay, so that's gamma. And so this is the equation. I think this is a simple equation. So that basically says P initial V initial gamma to the gamma power is equal to P final times V final to the gamma power, okay? Um, you can have um, different variation of this equation. You can um, write it in terms of T and V. So T V to gamma minus one then equal to constant. Or you can have like P um, variation of like in terms of P and T, uh, with the gamma um, to be a constant, okay? So, um, but starting from here, um, and then also with the ideal um, gas law equation, so you can have different variations for adiabatic process, okay? Um, <clears throat> the work done during an adiabatic process would be equal to minus P final V final minus P initial V initial divided by gamma minus one, okay? All right, so we were about to check on this example before we ran out of time. So let's take a look on the solution on this one um, here. So let me just um, show me show you the All right. So for this problem, we know it's an adiabatic process, all right? So you can write the equation. So this is the equation you can start with. PV to the gamma power equals to constant, all right? Uh, in another word, you can write like P initial V initial to the gamma power equals to TP the final V to the final to the gamma power, okay? Where gamma is equal to CP over CV, okay? So this is for an, monatomic ideal gas. So CP would be five halves NR and CV would be three halves of NR. Okay, so for monatomic <clears throat> ideal gas. All 
All right, so if you have a diatomic, so let me just write out um, for the scenario of diatomic. For a diatomic um, ideal gas, it's CV will be five halves, okay? Because you have two more degree of freedom, uh, rotational free um, degree of freedom. So then that's CV will be equal to five halves. So then CV will be this plus NR will be seven halves, okay? So for different scenario, um, if this is a diatomic uh, ideal gas, then you have CV and CP as different number. But in this case, this is uh, monatomic, so it's uh, phi over three for the gamma, okay? Now, because it's an ideal gas, so you can write PV equal to nRT still, okay? That it will apply. So starting with those two equations, you are given that the moles um, N is equal to half mole, and I also given that P1 is equal to 400 kilopascal. So 400 times 10 to the third, T1 is 300 Kelvin. You are given P2 equals to 160 or the final equals to 160 kilopascal. Um, you are looking for T2, right? You're looking for also V2, and then you're looking for W as well. Um, so it's um, find the final temperature, volume, work time, and the heat. Okay, heat observed, we know it's zero because it's, this is for adiabatic process. Okay, <clears throat> so basically, I'm just looking for those um, three quantities. All right. <clears throat> okay, so. As I mentioned, you can start from those two equations. Now you are given P and T, P1 and T1. You are given P2, you are looking for T2, all right? So you can actually rewrite this equation. So then this equation will have just P and T in it, okay? So that means you write V in terms of other quantities. So let's rewrite that. So then uh, V for ideal gas law, V is equal to nRT over P. Okay, so from here, ideal gas law, you can write that in that case. Now you're going to replace this one, the V with this expression in the first equation over there. So it becomes P times the V nRT over P, okay? To the gamma power equals to constant, okay? So this would be, um, over here, you have P here, you have, so let's write this way, P times N, R. So these two are constant, N and R are constant to the gamma, okay? And then T to the gamma, divided by P to the gamma, okay? Equals to constant. Now you can divide, because the N is 0.5, R is 8.31. So to the gamma, gamma is five over three. So this should be also a constant. So if you divide both sides by that, um, it should still give you a constant on this end. Okay, so this is still a constant. Maybe a constant prime, a different constant than the original constant, but it should be still a constant, okay? So that tells you that, um, so P to the power, so this is one here, this is minus gamma. So one minus gamma, T to the gamma should be equal to a constant of prime. Okay, so I'm just going to call it constant prime. All right, so then this is an equation for an adiabatic process. Okay, still this is for adiabatic process. Um, so you have P and T to the power one, P to the one minus gamma, T to the gamma equals to constant. All right, so which means P1 to one minus gamma, times T1 to the gamma should be equal to P2, one minus gamma, T2 to the gamma, okay? So from here, you'll see that um, P1 is given as that guy, T1 is given, P2 is given, so you can solve for T2, okay? So basically, um, you need to put P2 to the other side of the equation, all right? So then T2 to the gamma power, uh, let's write this way. So P1 
1 minus gamma t1 to the gamma over p2 1 to the 1 minus gamma equals to t2 to the gamma power, OK? Now, at this point, you can um, plug in the numbers t1 or p1 here. p1 is 400 times 10 to the third. OK, so 400 times 10 to the third. I'm going to just leave out the units because I know they are all in SI unit at this point, OK? 1 minus gamma, so it will be 1 minus 5 over 3 to that power. T1 is 300K to the gamma, 5 over 3, OK? That's the power, divided by P2. So P2 is given as 160 times 10 to the third Pascal. 1 minus um, 5 over 3 equals to T2 to 5 over 3 power, OK? Now, to solve for T2, you'll put the power of, so this is 5 over 3. So you want to um, put the power as 3 over 5 on there, OK? And then on this, on this side, you're calculating all this and then put um, 3 to the fifth. Of three of uh, three fifths, okay. So in that way, so then it will give you t two on this side, and then um, you can you can put in all this into your calculator. You will get about two hundred and eight Kelvin, okay. So then that will be your t two. All right, I'm going to pause for a few seconds to see if you guys have questions on this so far. You can unmute yourself and then let me know if you have questions at this moment. All right, so if that's clear to you, then uh, we can now, so we have solved for T2, okay? Now let's check on V2, all right? Because we know T2, we know P2, P2 is given. So then we can um, use the ideal guess law PV equal to NRT. So basically then it says um, P2, V2 should be equal to N R T2, okay? Then you can solve for V2 because all, all other terms um, are given. So V2 would be equal to N R T2 over P2, okay? That's 0.5 in moles, 8.31 times 208, okay? Divided by 106 times 10 to the third. All right, so this will give you 0 0.00540 meters to the Q, okay? Or 5.40 in liters, if you prefer to use liters here. All right. Next, let's take a look on the work time. So work time, you can um, use this equation directly, minus P2 V2, or minus P1 V1 on the top here, divide by gamma minus one, okay? So then there'll be minus of, um, now you have also the quantities are given. So P2 V2, all right, make sure they are all in SI unit. 
minus P1, 400 times 10 to the third times V1. Uh, we don't, we actually don't have V1, but right, okay, that's fine. Um, I didn't do it this way. So I use the relation that, remember for ideal gas, P1, V1 is equal to NR, T1, okay? So I actually use NR, T1 instead of P1 minus V1, okay? So I used um, 0.5 moles times 8.31 times T1, T1 is given. 300K, okay? Divided by gamma minus one. So five over three minus one on the denominator, okay? So all this into the calculator, it will give you 574 joules of energy of the work done by the gas, okay? Questions you guys might have on this one? All right, so as I say, I actually did this way, okay? But you can, um, there's other ways you can do it. You can stick with those two um, starting equations. Um, you are given P1, T1. So based on ideal gas law, you can actually figure out V1, okay? So that might be easier um, to, to do um, instead of like derive a relationship between P and T as I did. So, um, you can calculate V1 first, okay? So then you can start with um, P1 V1 to the gamma equals to P2 V2 to the gamma. Then you can solve for V2 first, okay, from there. Once you have V2, then return to the ideal gas law for, for the final status P2 V2 equal to NR T2. You can solve for T2 there, all right? Um, so that might be another way of doing this. And then you can calculate for the, um, the work you can use that equation, okay? That we derived um, last time. So for the um, work done. So so either way, um, there's um, always, um, or there's oftentimes like um, different ways solving a physics problem, okay? <clears throat> All right. So if you guys are clear, we are going to move on. So that will, um, do it for chapter three. So then we are going to look into chapter four today. Um, chapter four mainly focus on the second law of thermodynamics, okay? Um, so the first law of thermodynamics says the conservation of energy. So basically internal energy change equals to the heat change um, minus the work done by the system. Now let's take a look on the second law here. So but to start with, we'll um, look at um, the two types, two major types of the thermal processes, okay? So um, in this category, it's divided into reversible and ir irreversible processes. So for reversible process, it's a process in which the system and the environment can be restored to exactly the same initial status states that they were in before the process occurred, okay? If we can go backward along the path of the process. So basically, um, that's an ideal process. So in reality, um, it's you don't have, you actually couldn't do that in reality because you can imagine you can um, have the process go very slowly, but anyway, um, when it's done, then something has um, something that cannot be restored either for the system itself or uh, for the environment, okay? So it's not possible to have uh, both, to have both the system and environment um, restored to the original status without um, 
causing that some change that is um, can be recovered. Okay. So in reality, you are uh, having all the irreversible processes for whatever thermal process that happen. Okay. So um, irreversible process that means system either when well, the system and its environment cannot be restored to the, its original status at the same time. Okay. So there's something extra has to be done. So for example, if you have a gas system um, in this compartment with a wall here, and then the, on the other side of the um, container, it's vacuum. Once you make a small hole here, then the gas is going to be uh, expanded into the vacuum area, all right? But now for this, um, mathematical-wise, um, it might be happening um, like once the hole is open, now for all the gas to go back to this left-hand side. So mathematically, uh, um, statistically, it could be possible, but the possibility is very, very small. And then in reality, it doesn't happen at all, okay? So it has to be like every gas over here will randomly go back over there um, to the left-hand side, okay? But it doesn't happen in reality, okay? In reality, so a lot of process happens, um, then uh, you will not go back again unless some, some, um, some, some extra work uh, is, is done okay, for that. So that's basically the second law of thermodynamics, uh, one of the statements. It says the heat will never flow spontaneously from a cold object to a hot object. So in reality, heat flows from a hot object to a cold object. Okay, So that's what will happen spontaneously. All right. Um, that means it will happen naturally, okay? Now, later on in, this, uh, in the chapter, we will learn that if you do extra work, then heat can flow from a cold object to a hot object, but that's without, with the extra work, okay? That's been put in. So <clears throat> now let's take a look on the applications of the thermal, um, the second law of thermodynamics, okay? So basically you have heat flow from a hot object to a cold object. And then during the process, some of the heat can be converted into mechanical work, okay? So that's what a heat engine does, all right? So heat engine will take in the heat from pretty much like from boiling of water. Um, so heat being input into the water system, then start in the steam here. And um, this is the gas over here will push the piston or convert into mechanical work. Okay, so in that sense. Um, for your car engine, this is how it works. It takes in air and fuel mixture um, initially, all right? And the air and fuel mixture is being compressed to a small volume. And then the sparker over here, you ignite the mixture of fuel and air. So the chemical energy is being released as the heat for the gas over here that will give the heat, um, the gas here, um, a lot of pressure and temperature will rise as well. So then it will push the piston over here. We will um, then do mechanical work, okay? After the work, mechanical work is done, the piston will be pushed backward with the hot air being released, exhaust heat is the hot air that being released to the environment, okay? So that's one full cycle. So then it returns to its initial um, status and then um, start a second cycle from, from A here, okay? All right, now for the air and fuel mixture or the, um, after the ignition, the, the gas component in the, in the engine, you, you can see, um, so it takes in heat from the combustion there. So that's the temp when the pressure rise as well as the temperature will rise, okay? Um, and then it goes through adiabatic process, all right? Converting the, the heat, part of the heat takes into mechanical work and then um, dump the excess heat to the um, surrounding, all right? And then goes back to return to its initial um, position and then starts the cycle again, all right? So, um, this is a schematic drawing of a heat engine. So basically it takes heat from a high temperature um, reservoir and then 
convert part of the heat into mechanical work and then dump the excess heat to the surrounding. Okay. On the PV diagram here for the for the the gas system that in the engine, you can see on the PV diagram here, you can see for full cycle, full cyclic cycle. So less area enclosed here. So that's the how much work has been done for the process. Okay, the network. All right. So less a network here. So mathematically, this can be expressed very simply. So W equals to Q H, which is the heat takes in from the hot reservoir minus the Q H Q C, the heat excess heat dumped to the surrounding of the cold reservoir. Okay, and then mechanical work has been done. All right, for a cyclical process. Now, um, a lot of people have tried to design an engine that can convert all the heat to the mechanical work, but that's not possible, okay? So that's the second uh, statement or a different um, version of the second law of um, thermodynamics. So it says it's not possible in any system for heat transfer from a reservoir to completely convert to work in a cyclical process in which the system returns to its initial status, okay? So you are not able to do, uh, to convert 100% of heat takes in into mechanical work. All right, so then for a heat engine, there are three components. You need a hot temperature reservoir. For a car engine, then it's the, um, the gas, the after combustion of the fuel, that gas um, contains the heat, okay? And then a low temperature reservoir for, again, for a car engine, it's the environment. Um, and then a cyclical engine, okay? That's the um, engine that does work. Okay, three components. And then again, W equals to QH minus QC or QH equal to W plus QC. So for an engine, you will want to know what's the efficiency of an engine, okay? So that means um, how much work it can convert it or how much heat it takes in. Oh, let's put it this way. That, that means how much work can be done uh, when it takes in a certain amount of heat, QH, okay? So then efficiency will be the work time divided by the heat takes in QH, all right? So that's the um, definition. It can be rewritten as QH minus QC over QH because work equals to QH minus QC, all right? Or if you rewrite this um, middle uh, expression here, then it becomes one minus QC over QH, okay? Efficiency is dimensionless, it's energy over energy. All right, let's take a look on um, a quick example here on the engine here. It says that an engine receives 660 joules of heat from a hot reservoir and gives off 420 joules of heat to a cold reservoir. What are the work done and efficiency of this engine? Okay, so QH is this guy, QC is this guy what will be W and then what will be the efficiency, all right? You guys can give it a try. You can take a look at the solution together in um, just a couple of minutes, I think it should be enough.
All right. So this should be straightforward here. Um, so A, you're looking for work done. It should be equal to QH minus QC, all right? It tells you QH is 660 and then QC is 240 or 420, 420 joules. So then work done will be 240 joules, okay? Now for the efficiency, it will be equal to E will be equal to work divided by QH, the work done divided by the heat um, that takes in, the engine takes in. So 240 joules over 660 joules, okay? That should be roughly 0 0.364, all right? Uh, a, lot of, a lot of times this can be expressed in uh, percentage. 36.4 percent all right so um the responses i receive on this end um they are correct okay all right but let me know if you have questions on this one okay so that's on heat engine. Now let's take a look on some other applications. So as I mentioned, the second law of thermodynamics says heat will not flow spontaneously from a cold reservoir to a hot reservoir. But if you have um, the external work done, being done, then it's possible, okay? So um, a lot of the appliances we are using at home, for example, um, refrigerators and air conditioner, um, not the, yeah, air conditioners and the heat pumps. They are, um, the way they work is they all take the heat from a cold reservoir, actually a cold environment with the electrical power or electrical work being done in that sense. Um, and then deliver the total heat the excess heat to a higher temperature environment, okay? So for a refrigerator, um, we will take them one by one. So for a refrigerator here, what it does is it takes heat from the food you put in the refrigerator. So from the inside of the refrigerator with the work dump, the electrical work, okay? And then it dumps the excess heat to the um, surrounding the hot reservoir, which is the room temperature of the kitchen, okay? So in that sense, um, in this case, you will have QC, the cold, the heat removed from the inside of the refrigerator plus the uh, electrical work and equals to the, all the, the heat dumped to the, the kitchen, okay? The outside environment of the refrigerator, all right? So, um, in reality, this is uh, how uh, the uh, refrigerator would look like, okay? So uh, the heat is being done to the um, kitchen. So in that sense, it's not possible that if you open the door of the refrigerator, um, the overall temperature of the kitchen will raise because you can only just remove QC, but you add to the room the total QH, right? QH is greater than QC by the amount of the work done. So W is being added, okay? So overall, you are adding heat to the room instead of taking heat off, okay? All right, now for a refrigerator, you pretty much are interested in how much heat it can remove given the amount of work needed, okay? So then this is called the coefficient of performance of the refrigerator, COP or K sub R, all right? That's equal to the amount of heat can be removed by given the amount of work needed. Okay, so QC over W is um, the coefficient of performance for a refrigerator. Now W can be also, again, can be written as QH minus QC. So then um, COP or K sub R can be written as QC over QH minus QC, all right? So let's take a look on um, the example of a refrigerator here. It says a refrigerator with a co coefficient, coefficient of performance of 1.75 absorbs um, 
the amount of heat from a low temperature reservoir, all right? So what we know here is, Um, it tells us that for this refrigerator, the KR or COP, K sub R, is equal to 1.75. All right, I, uh, let me just go back one slide. I just want to make a comment on the COP here. So if you want to buy a refrigerator, you'll be looking at this COP or K sub R. So the larger, the better, right? So that means uh, for given amount of uh, electricity needed um, for W, so that's the consumption of your electricity, then you can remove as much heat as you can, that would be better, right? QC as large as possible under the same W, okay? So then when you're looking for a refrigerator, you want to, ha it had to have a um, higher coefficients of performance, all right? So let's go back to the Example here. So it tells you the COP 1.75, and then it tells you that it absorbs that much of heat. So that's QC. It's 3.45 times 10 to the fourth joules. It's asking you a how much mechanical work is to required for a cycle. Okay. So this is for a cycle. So then you can um, calculate what's W there. Um, KR is equal to QC divided by W basically. And then also this is um, an engine. So then um, QH equal to QC plus W, these two equation, okay. Um, you will need those two. For B is asking you what's the QH, all right, dumped. Now for C, it's asking you if the refrigerator has a power P, which is equal to work divided by T, all right? That's 150 watts. How long does it take to cool 500 grams of water from 20 degrees Celsius to two degrees Celsius, okay? So in this case, the QC would be the heat loss of the water. So that means um, the mass of the water C, of the water and then delta T of water, okay? So you probably want to take absolute value here because this will be a negative number, which means heat being removed, how much heat being removed, okay? Remember CW is 4186 joules over kilogram degree Celsius. All right. I'm going to give you guys a few minutes um, to work on this and then we can take a look at the solution together after that.
All right. So let's take a look here together. So um, K of R equals QC over W. You are given this and this. So you can calculate W very easily. Um, w should be equal to then Q of C over K sub R, okay? So Q of C, um, 3.45 times 10 to the fourth joules um, divided by the 1.75. All right, that will be 1.97 times 10 to the fourth joules. All right. <clears throat> now for B, um, it should be also um, easy to calculate because QH is just equal to QC plus W. So then 4.3.45 times 10 to the fourth plus 1.97 times 10 to the fourth. Okay, that will give you Q of H. Uh, will be 5.42 times 10 to the fourth joules. All right. <clears throat> For C, um, it's a little bit more complicated here. So basically, you want to see how much um, heat is being removed from the water. Okay. You have 500 grams of water. So QC, um, that should be equal to. You are going to take the absolute values there. So let's do this. Um, MW, CW, delta T, and absolute values. Okay. So 0.5 kilogram. Okay. So it's 500 grams, which means 0.5 kilogram times 4186 joules over kilogram degree Celsius. Delta T will be the final two degrees Celsius minus initial 20 degrees Celsius. Okay. You take absolute values there to be how much heat is being removed, Q sub C. Um, this is 37,674, okay, 37,674 joules, okay. Um, so now this is QC, it's asking you for how much time it takes, all right? So from QC, you can calculate how much work is needed, right? And then from there, so you can calculate if you are given work, power is given as 150, then you can calculate how much time T is needed. Okay, so you want to solve for work first. Again, work is equal to QC over K sub R. So 37,674 joules divided by 1.75. That will give you 21,528 joules of work needed for this uh, process. So then according to P equals to W over T, so then T equals to work divided by P in the power, okay? So 21,528 joules divided by the power of 150 watts which is joules per second. So that will give you seconds, okay? 143.52 seconds, okay? So it's a little bit under two minutes, 2.5, two and a half minutes, okay? So that's how much time needed. Any questions you guys might have? <clears throat> That's one response that um, you calculate about 8.6 minutes. I th I'm assuming it looks to me that you didn't calculate work. Instead, you use the Q um, lost from the water as the work. It looks like that way. But you need to calculate work first. All right, just one extra step there. Questions you guys might have? All right. So if not, um, we can take a look on um, uh, air conditioner, okay? So an air conditioner is um, similar to a refrigerator. So basically you are just treating like the whole house 
as the inside of the refrigerator. Okay, so then um, that's basically an air conditioner. So it removes heat from inside of the house, all right? With the work done, electric work um, um, done to the engine there, to the, uh, for the air conditioner, and then it dumped the excess heat to the outside environment, okay? So in this process, you can see the heat removed should be less than the heat dumped to the outside environment, okay? So just the, the same in less sense. Um, next will be uh, and the, the final appliance here we'll be, we'll be looking at is called a heat pump. So which is typically used in the winter. So in that case, then the heat is being um, removed from the outside cold air, all right, with the uh, work done by the heat pump. And then um, there's more heat being dumped onto the inside air, okay? So heat is in, being added to the inside air, okay? So in that case. So then QH equal to again, W plus QC. For a heat pump, we then will be interested on the, um, how much heat it can be added to the inside of the room. Okay, so the coefficient for a performance for heat pump is K sub P equal to QH. Okay, in this case, QH over W. So the more QH you can add it to the room, the better the heat pump. Um, Yes, okay. So you can rewrite it as Q H divided by Q H minus Q C, which will give you W. All right. All right. Um for ideal heat pump, I think we'll talk about this um next time. Okay, so for a kind of heat um relationship, we'll we'll mention this next time. All right. So let me see. I think there's a couple more slides I just want to briefly mention. Let me just see if I can bring, bring it up here. All right, there you go. I just want to mention about like um, there's um, different versions of second law of thermodynamics. So um, there are two other one, two other statements. One is called Kelvin statement, which says no system can absorb heat from a single reservoir and convert it entirely into work without additional net changes in the system or its surrounding. Okay, so this is basically. Um, Similar to like, if you want to convert all the heat um, absorbed into mechanical work, that's not possible, okay? But um, just mention it in a slightly different way. Um, Klaus's statement says, a process whose only net result is to absorb heat from a cold reservoir and release the same amount of heat to a hot reservoir is impossible, okay? So that means um, heat is not, heat cannot flow from a hot, cold reservoir to a hot reservoir without some extra work, okay? All right, and then some uh, perpetual uh, machines, um, or oh, this is the um, schematic illustration of the, the previous two statements, okay? So you cannot convert all the heat takes into work totally. That's not possible, which means a perfect heat engine, okay? Now, um, heat, flow from a cold reservoir to a hot reservoir that will not be possible without causing any net change in the um, system or environment. So this is a perfect uh, refrigerator. This is also not possible, okay? Um, we'll stop here, okay? And then um, tomorrow we'll have our exam number one, okay? So I'll then see you guys tomorrow, bye.